All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, warm welcome. Uh, I would just begin by uh, giving you a brief introduction about uh, IPN or Indian Philosophy Network and the IPN lectures uh, that we have been running. Uh, and I'll do a very brief introduction for uh, our speaker today as well. So Indian Philosophy Network or IPN is a network of professional philosophers in India, both within and outside academia. Uh, it aims to build an equitable ecosystem for philosophers in India to provide crucial peer support for research, teaching and other professional activities. The network enables better awareness of scholars working in specific areas, thereby facilitating interactions and collaborations. The first set of IPN lectures uh, has been focusing on the theme of writing and publishing in philosophy. These lectures uh, aim at addressing some common questions that philosophy researchers are likely to have about doing philosophy, such as how do we teach philosophy, how do we conceptualize and execute philosophy projects, how do we do research, write and publish our work. So IPN lectures aim to initiate conversation and deliberations on these dimensions of philosophy. So today we are very uh, fortunate to have with us Professor Mitchell Green, uh, who's going to uh, address us about navigating philosophy journals, steering towards acceptance. Uh, Professor Green uh, is uh, Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut. Uh, he conducts research on topics in the philosophy of language, pragmatics, philosophy of mind and aesthetics. He is the founding director of Project Hi-Fi, which supports philosophical inquiry in American high schools. In addition to over 50 published articles, Professor Green has written or co-authored four books, uh, Self-Expression, published by Oxford University Press, Moose Paradox, co co-edited by John Williams, Oxford University Press, Engaging Philosophy, A Brief Introduction, Hackett Publishing, and Know Thyself, The Values and Limits of Self-Knowledge, published by Rutledge. And the last one, I think, was also a, a very popular course at uh, Coursera. Uh, so welcome once again, Professor uh, Green, and over to you. Thanks very much, C. Truth. I appreciate it. And I'm uh, delighted and honored to be able to present to you all um, my, I'll introduce some of my colleagues here that I can see. Jan Michel is with us as well. He's an associate editor with the journal Philosophia. Hannah Froget is um, on the transfer desk. I believe she's based in the UK. And um, uh, Prajana Kate is with us from the transfer desk office that's in Pune, India. And, and I think that's everybody. Um, but I appreciate everybody taking the time to, you know, to join us for this conversation. And my aim here is to help provide information that I hope will be useful for you as you navigate the publishing process in Anglophone philosophy, at least. And at least when I was starting out my publishing career 30 years ago, the whole process seemed kind of mis mysterious to me. And I made a lot of mistakes, uh, used up valuable time unnecessarily. And I'm hoping to give you some guidance if I can that might help you avoid those sorts of things. I'll be focusing on the journal Philosophia because that's what I'm editor in chief of, that's what I know best. But I'll try to make occasional comments um, about other journals as I understand them as well. I will have time. I will present first. Here's my kind of schedule. Let's see if I can get it going. Here we go. I'll present uh, some, some topics I want to discuss first. And then section eight of our discussion today will be Anna Froget taking over. And she'll talk about the whole process of transferring a uh, submission from one journal to another. That's when she'll take over the conversation. I will also respond to some of the questions. This is part six that have been raised in the Google Google uh, questionnaire that Sue Truth kindly sent out to you. But I won't have time to do to respond to all the questions that were raised. And hopefully, we'll have fifteen or so minutes at the end of our meeting today to ask any to answer any questions that might come up as we go. If there's something that I'm saying as I speak that you find it totally unintelligible, very obscure. Put a question in the chat and I'll try to respond to it. Maybe Jan, if you could, if you see any such question popping up in the chat, unmute yourself and let me know. Just say, hey Mitch, you know, check this out. So I'm not, so I'm not um, ignoring you. But in general, it's probably easiest to let the questions come at the end. So I'll get started. So one thing I want to emphasize, this is something that I didn't understand 30 years ago when I started to publish. I thought that when a journal published a paper of mine, they were doing me a favor. But I think actually it's better to see journals and authors of articles that get published in journals as sort of in a transaction in which each party benefits from that transaction. Journals want to publish high quality and influential research that's going to add to their prestige and their status in the profession, and thereby their publishers will be able to, to uh, monetize that, that quantity. 
at the same time, many, perhaps most academics want to publish in double blind, refereed international journals. It's going to help advance their career, as well as to help them disseminate their ideas and learn more and get a deeper understanding of the topics that they care about. In the US and the UK and, and Aust Australasia, for the most part, my experience is that low acceptance rate in a journal is a sort of badge of status. You can brag about being having an article published in a journal that has a 5% or something acceptance rate, but I'm not, I've been convinced over the last several, uh, last year, I would say that that's not the best way of measuring the quality of a journal. I think a better way is to measure its impact. For example, the number and types of citations, the extent to which articles in the journal are used in teaching and research and so forth, and that might or might not correspond to, to a low acceptance rate. It might be that a specialist journal has a high acceptance rate only because certain a limited uh, number of people uh, submit papers to it. So I think we should not be too hung up on acceptance rates, but rather how impactful is a journal. And once a journal is impactful in the appropriate way, we're going to have a situation in which both researcher and the journal are going to benefit when those high quality impactful research uh, work are published. And as you may know, Philosophia has been trying to overtly, intentionally open its doors, so to speak, to the international community. Our subtitle is no longer Philosophical Quarterly of Israel, but rather a global journal of philosophy in an attempt to signal that we want, we very much want people from outside of what I guess is the sort of mainstream Anglophone, North, North American, Australasian, Western European uh, philosophical communities. Contributions from those places are great, but we want people from other other cultures and countries doing so as well. Certainly India is an important uh, potential contributor there. So we very much want to see your submission. So let me say a little bit about some of the kind of how sausages made, how the sausages made part of what journals are, or at least should be looking for based on my experience, both, both as an author, as well as ser having served as an editor of this journal for, for about a year. And this is here's something that I didn't know when I started out. We're not so much looking for your views on a philosophical problem, even if those views are well argued. Rather, think of journals as venues for multiple conversations that have been making their way through the journals for years or decades, maybe even a century or more. And those conversations are attempting to answer various questions. So if, if you look at an issue of a journal, if you understand some of the topics that are being discussed, you'll see this article is probably a response to something that happened elsewhere, a previous art publication in this journal or another one, and they can trace back for years, maybe even decades, in which you've got a dialectical process making their way through multiple journals. And then I would suggest some of these questions, I would also want to say some of these questions have been answered or set aside, others are still what I would call live. So I'm sure you can think of uh, questions that were heavily debated in the 70s or 80s in philosophy of mind or philosophy of language or ethics that are no longer at the top of people's, people's minds. That's okay. I want to avoid the questions that are no longer live. Rather, instead, choose a live question, a question that's still something that gets, that, get, that gets legitimate discussion, and then build your submission around the project of helping to answer that question. What does helping to answer a live question mean? Well, I think it means a number of things. One way to do so would be to give what you think to be a well-argued, complete and determined answer to the question. Um, uh, is the mind identical with the body or is, are ethical facts subjectively real or something of the sort? That's fine if you can do it, but those are big complicated questions that are difficult to tackle at this stage of research and one, one seven or 8,000 word article. Another way of helping to answer a question is to, for example, rule out certain possible answers. So if my question, a non-philosophical question is how many apples are there in the bowl? A partial answer to that question is, there are between four and six. I can't be any more specific. That can still be a contribution to knowledge, depending upon what the state of play is in the conversation as, as it is right now. So helping to answer a question might be, on, on the other hand, I think there's an ambiguity in the way the question is typically posed and people discuss it. Let's disambiguate that and then try to figure out which is a better version of the, of the question to answer now that we have that disambiguation. So helping to answer a live question is given that it can be a number of different things, each of which has a fairly determined content, is something that I would urge you to, to focus on. And note, uh, Bene, you have not specified a live philosophical question with a phrase like the God question or the question of right and wrong. I see these uh, types of uh, phrases often in submissions to Philosophia. These phrases merely provoke the reply, 
which particular question about God or ethics or something of the sort do you have in mind? So try as best you can to specify sharply articulated question that you want to try to answer, and then go for it in terms of trying to provide at least a partial answer to that live question. And it's, help, it's helpful to look at tables of contents of journals. So here's a table, part of a table of contents that I did a screenshot of from uh, one of the issues of Philosophia that came out in 2023. Um, if you work on any of the topics that are mentioned in any of these, you'll probably be able to say, okay, I know some of the people that work on these things. I know some recent publications on these topics. And hopefully I can identify this one, for example, as a new contribution. I want to go check it out, see whether I've got something to say now that the author has published a paper in it. I should mention, just to clarify, that this article on Tractatus and later article on Friedrich, uh, Friedrich Weissmann probably are not ones that we would consider at this point, because as of 2023, the journal Philosophy, at least, is no longer uh, considering art articles that are primarily in history and philosophy. And I consider articles, uh, topics from before 19, before 2050, let me try it again, before 1950 as essentially history of philosophy. So these will have been ones that were, that were submitted and accepted before, before 2023. But uh, articles like this, or you could go to the, that, that was a screenshot of the hard copy. Here's a, um, here's the online version of the, of the journal. And I should say Philosophia has on its, on its website, is, uh, tables of contents for all issues of the journal going back to its first volume back in 1972. So it's helpful to go back and see if you can trace the dialectic of a certain question that you want to pursue. It can be very helpful, informative, sometimes a little bit overwhelming, but I urge you to do it as you prepare an article to submit. I want to get a little more about what journals are or should be looking for. So this answering a live question is not method is not the only possible method you could pursue. You might think that a live question has a dubious presupposition or is some, for some other reason a bad one. That's a bit more of a sort of ambitious and risky kind of project, but that's still something that, that our journals should be interested in. You may think that we should resuscitate a question that's considered no longer live. That's okay. Give you reasons for doing so. These, these are riskier strategies, but in each case, you might argue that what that we should change the question we're at, question or questions we're asking on a certain topic. And if you know the history of philosophy over the last 50 or 75 years, you know that some of the most important developments in the field have been due to people changing the question or, or, or questions that are discussed by philosophers. So that's okay, but it's a it's an upward battle because referees will be skeptical that we need to that we need to revise the questions that we're asking. But that doesn't mean you can't overwhelm the, your skepticism. So keep, if you take this risky path, explain clearly that you're doing so and why it is. Keep your expectations low. It, may, it might take submissions to multiple journals until you finally win over an audience to, with, with your case. So let me be a little more specific about the sort of to-do list as you prepare a submission to a journal. And this will vary a little bit about what kind, depending on what kind of journal you're submitting to, but I hope some of what I say will be fairly general. So first of all, and this is really important, I find this to be an issue with lots of submissions that we see to ours, Define any jargon that you use. If you use jargon, you should define it, except for jargon that you can expect anybody with an advanced degree in philosophy to understand. So a priori, sure. Um, but beyond that, when in doubt, define your jargon. Avoid metaphors and other figures of speech whenever possible. Do all that you can to help the reader know what you're saying and your reasons for it. You can even use the premise and conclusion method to clarify your argument if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes that can be a little bit too pedantic, but, it, but generally speaking, it can help you clarify your own thought and help the reader understand what you're up to. Clarity, clarity, clarity. Make sure you know what the state of the art is in the literature and that you're taking a step further and also that you're making clear to the reader that you're taking a step further beyond the state of the art in the literature. I see lots of referees shoot down submissions because they say, oh, nice idea, but it's basically what you know so-and-so said in uh, Australasian Journal of Philosophy you know, last year or something of the sort in which case that will result in your submission not being accepted, most likely. So make sure that you know what the state of play is in the literature. And that can be difficult sometimes, but it is part of your job. I should say, knowing what the state of the art and literature is, is not the same thing as doing a literature review in the article itself. Generally speaking, that's just going to be too, just take too much space. will make your article too long. And so it's only for topics that have relatively small literature that a lit review is going to be appropriate. Otherwise, I would suggest do the review of the most recent developments on the topic and leave the sort of early history of that topic um, in the background. Whenever possible, consider as well as reply to objections to your position. That's a good thing to do towards the end of your paper. 
Have a trusted colleague read and offer comments on a draft, either in person or online. And if it's in person, I would urge you to buy them lunch to repay them for the favor or something of the sort. And then think hard about who your audience is. My approach to this would be, if it's a general philosophical journal like Philosophia, aim to address a PhD in philosophy, someone who's got an advanced degree, terminal degree in philosophy, who works in another field than your own. So for example, if your submission's in epistemology, you should write, I should write my article in such a way that it's intelligible to an ethicist, vice versa. I think the norms are different in, in specialist journals like philosophy of science or episteme. If I'm submitting to something in philosophy of science, I don't have to worry about, me, about, about being intelligible to an ethicist. But my approach would be, if you're submitting to a general philosophical journal, that should mean someone who's outside your field but is also a professional philosopher should be able to understand what you've written. Also, whenever possible, signpost. So it's really helpful to, at the end of a certain section or beginning of a new section, say, thus far I've argued that blah, blah, blah. In the section, I'll support one of the premises that I used in my previous argument, premise three, by saying blah, blah, blah. Or you might say, a reader might at this point object to my contention C as follows. That's fine, respond to that objection. By the way, don't worry about using the first person pronoun in a, in a philosophy submission that's perfectly acceptable. I wouldn't start every sentence with it, but it's perfectly acceptable to refer to yourself explicitly. And look for ways to avoid any unnecessary verbiage. As Shakespeare said, brevity is the soul of wit. When I submit or have submitted articles to conferences, for example, or journals that have a strict word limit, it's painful, but also really instructive to be forced to uh, cut down my submission to, to a, word, a word limit. It's hard work, but really valuable work. And it's in good education to help you learn how to write in a very succinct way. So I, I definitely support that and suggest you do it. And also you might ask, can you make a non-decorative reference to one or more articles that have appeared in the journal that you're submitting to? That helps the journal understand that your submission is going to be contributing to that conversation that I, that I mentioned earlier that's making its way dialectically through that and other journals, if it's possible. But I wouldn't do it just for decorative purposes, but only if you've got a legitimate thing, a substantive thing to say about an earlier publication. So again, think about your audience. The audience is, might, be, might be difficult to discern, but it's good to have in mind who those PhDs in philosophy are, what they're like, what their expectations are, what you can expect them to know, what you can't. A little bit more about preparing your submission, more nuts and bolts. Um, I, my experience is that most journals, including Philosophia, frown upon submissions that reply exclusively to a previously published article. If you're just writing a, a response to one particular article that has appeared, for example, in that journal, that's not always easy to do. I would say you might have as your main goal to respond to that, but you also could have as your goal, it would be good to expand your discussion so that it applies to more than just that one author, but to people who have um, broader interests as well. Be sure, of course, to anonymize your submission. We run into that difficulty not infrequently. People who haven't sufficiently anonymized their submission. Jan can, Jan can attest to that. I'd say suggest possible referees in Springer Nature submissions. You're always invited to suggest possible referees. But again, this is something I see often. I would not suggest people who you may appear to be, even if you aren't, appear to be too sort of cozy with. So I would not suggest as possible referees people who work at your home institution, even if you think they're leading experts on the topic. The danger is that they will appear to be someone who might give you too much uh, too much uh, credit. The bulk of your article should not be summarized in the work of others. That's a kind of a repeat of the literature review point I made earlier. And I'd say avoid sometimes what the journalists call mission creep. Be sure to do what you say you're going to do and check. There's a, always a danger of slightly changing the subject in ways that you might not be conscious of between the beginning and the end of the article. Avoid that. I would say at this point, when you're getting ready to submit an article, don't worry about formatting your paper according to the journal's style. The journal will say, here's our style, but it's probably a waste of your time to do that because you should just wait until the, the paper is accepted. And often that's done automatically anyway at this point. Also, minimize intricacy. I remember when I was submitting papers starting out my career, I would sometimes get frustrated because a referee said, oh, the author doesn't consider this problem. But my, my exasperated response was, I did consider that, that, that problem in footnote 37. Why did you miss it? And the answer is, you can't expect a referee to read into the, into the footnotes that, with that level of detail. You've got something that needs to be said, put it in the text. Footnotes should be very much background, not part of the dialectic itself. Don't bury the lead. And I recognize that English is hard for a non-native speaker. I can't imagine um, learning a, a language and, uh, other than my native language and trying to 
write and publish philosophy in it. That'd be extremely difficult. But it's helpful to ask a good English speaker for help, of course, by the lunch afterwards. I should also say I've just recently learned about a movement um, called the Barcelona Principles that tries to advocate for journals being more um, permissive about non-native non English speakers that are interested that, that want to publish in English but whose prose is not perhaps as idiomatic and elegant as it would be if they were a native if, if they were a native anglophone i favor that that attitude i hope to convince my editorial team to do so as well over the coming months and to hope and i hope to convince springer nature to to move in that direction as well with springer nature being a vast organization that might take some time but as an editor i will tend to not be too worried if a referee says this author is writing in a way that shows they're not a native English speaker. They need to fix the paper before it gets published. So it's all idiomatic and, and elegant and so forth. That's not a big worry for me. And so I don't want you to spend a huge amount of time on those sorts of issues. Is it clear? Is it direct? Does it say, make the philosophical point that it needs to? That's fine. If it uses slightly awkward English, then that's just not a big deal. And do multiple reads through with different focus each time. This can be helpful too. One read, grammar style, another read, content, another read, citations, another read, user friendliness, et cetera. Those are different projects. Each one should take you an hour or two, but I would not confuse them because you're just, you have too many different dimensions to focus on. And so separate them is what I would suggest. And then before you submit, go to, if you're submitting to a Springer Nature journal, such as Philosophia, go to their submission guidelines or the appropriate submission guidelines for whatever journal you're submitting to, and they'll give you details about what the formatting should be like, or at least in terms of things like, we've got one, one section where you need to declare any potential conflicts of interest, and another where you need to declare that you don't have the paper under submission somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure you go through all that written law. So section four, let me talk a little bit about the review process now, what that looks like from our side. When an author submits an article, thus in the case of Spring Nature, what I know best, is gonna to check to make sure that all the formal requirements have been met. They're able to identify who the author is. They're able to uh, determine that they that they don't have something else of a very similar kind under submission with another Spring Nature journal, et cetera, et cetera. The editor-in-chief, that's me, for example, is gonna review that submission to see whether it gets off their desk. Otherwise, it gets what's called a desk rejection. And I'll come back to a moment about what that means and considerations that, that result in a desk rejection. If the submission survives the desk rejection process, that is, does not get desk rejected, then it goes to, an, I will send it to an associate editor, like for example, um, Dr. Michel, and he will then be the handling editor, the person that's in charge of, first of all, finding referees, and then a month or a month and a half later, harassing those referees so they haven't submitted the reports yet. And then after the reports have come in, adjudicating those reports. And based on those reports, the associate editor is then going to make a recommendation to me, and then I'll decide on a verdict. I might go back and forth with the associate editor and say, why did you want to give this person a, a major revisions as opposed to a reject or something of the sort? We might have a little bit of, of back and forth, but hopefully we'll equilibrate pretty soon and come up with a, with a decision. I tend to default to the authority of the associate editors that work for the journal um, and have to have special reasons. Think of myself as having to have special reasons for sort of overruling their, their verdict. But all final verdicts that go to the author will come from me and they'll direct, go directly to the author. This process might take something like four to six months, but there's a lot of variability because, for example, as I'll say in a moment, it can take a long time to find referees or referees might drag their feet and we've got to chase them down. Let me talk a little bit about desk rejection. What sort of things trigger a desk rejection? That's called reject without review, slightly more, slightly more uh, gentle. Well, one reason, this is specifically for Philosophia, because as of 23, 23 as, I, as I said, we're not publishing articles in history of philosophy or articles that are too technical. So that applies to us. And that does not mean your article is bad. What it means is it's just outside of our outside of our remit. Or the article might not be sufficiently philosophical. It might be primarily concerned with, for example, matters that are spiritual or matters that are empirical. That's fine, but, and I'll make a recommendation as to other journals and the desk, the, the transfer desk folks will make recommendations as well as to where the, those articles might be better placed. Or it might be primarily comparative. You're comparing two schools of thought, or it might be review of a certain literature. Um, in either case, it's not going to be, at least in my book, answering a live philosophical question. And so it's not one that we would, that we would want to send out for potential external reviewing. Or it might just be poorly, poorly written, or it might make some highly controversial or dubious premises, assume some highly controversial or dubious premises. 
or maybe this has been scooped by prior publication, possibly including that of the author. So if I, as editor in chief, know that the recent publication said something that's pretty that's pretty much the same as what this author is saying, I'll say, sorry, we're not going to consider this. You at least need to go back and figure out how you're going beyond what this other recent publication has said. Or if I can't verify, or if the, if, if the publisher can't verify the identity of the author, or discovers as something that is something that happened to us recently, a multiple submission issue. If an author has submitted the article that they want us to consider, it's under submission elsewhere. We'll re, we'll reject it immediately because it's understood that if you're submitting an article to Philosophia or any Springer Nature journal, it's it's the, the, that journal has ex, exclusive uh, uh, rights to decide whether or not to publish it. And um, Jail Austin once talked about the law of diminishing fleas, where the idea is sometimes philosophers get hung up on tinier and tinier and more and more minute topics, and we lose the importance of the the thing, keeping in mind the tree as opposed to the, the, the forest as opposed to the trees. Um, if there's a feeling that the article, the topic that you're writing on and the point that you're making about it is extremely minute, we'll probably desk reject it on, on that basis. And my experience is that deciding whether or not to just reject a submission can take about two to four weeks. Depends on how big my backlog is. Some uh, some weeks I get ten or fifteen new submissions that I've got to work my way through in terms of whether or not to decide whether or not to decide on desk rejection. I can't always get to those immediately, but I do my best. Okay, let me talk a little bit more about finding referees. This is a difficult part of the process on our side because a good referee is hard to find. They've got to be qualified to assess your article fairly. They've got to be impartial and they've got to be available. As Jan can attest, I think he might hold the record for number of referees that he's uh, approached without that he's been unable to get on board. Uh, um, we also, there's another constraint, try to avoid referees who are criticized in the submitted article and who, or, or who might otherwise have a conflict of interest. That, I guess, speaks to the impartiality point above. Sometimes ask 12 to 15 people before getting two referees to agree to referee. So, and it's often things like understandable, you know, my partner just just had a baby or removing or I've been very sick and I'm trying to catch up with my with my work and so forth. Or I've got seven other articles that I've re agreed to referee. I, and if I take any more, I'm, my head will explode or something. Sort. Those are all understandable reasons why people have to turn us down. Um, but it can take sometimes a couple of months before we find a referee that's able, qualified, impartial, et cetera. When a referee does agree, they usually they have 45 days to submit a report as a default. So that's a month and a half. I would say, in light of all this, try to empathize with your referee. Suppose your article has been submitted, it's made it's past, made it made, it's made it past the desk rejection process. That is, it's not been desk rejected. It's gone out to an associate editor. The associate editor has found referees. They're working, they're starting to work to read your paper and understand it and start to write a report. But just keep in mind they're probably just as overworked and stressed out as you are. Please don't make their job harder than it need be. So again, that's speaking to the don't bury the lead part of the su suggestion that I made earlier about making sure your article is it's clear right up front what you're doing, why, what contribution you're trying to make, et cetera. Those things that diverge from that are going to make the referee's job more difficult. What about adjudicating reports? What if, what if Jan gets from one referee a yes and another referee says no or something of the sort? Well, first of all, what are the possible verdicts? Uh, that come from our types of journals that are Springer Nature journals. They might be accept, might be minor revisions, might be major revisions, might be reject, might be reject, do not transfer. We'll speak to that when, when, the, trans, when the transfer desk team uh, talks. We might have revised before review. That is, I might, I might say, I'm not going to desk reject it, but you need to make some changes before I'm even going to consider that question. In the last couple months, I've sent out several revised before review. But this sort of menu of possible options is not going to be the same for, for all journals. I should also say, say straight acceptance is really nice, but it's rare, and it should maybe make you nervous. If the uh, article you've submitted to a journal gets accepted without any suggestion, suggested changes, you might wonder whether or not the refereeing process is quite as rigorous as it might have been. It's pretty rare to get a, uh, acceptance with no, with no expected changes at all. When referees disagree, that can raise difficult questions. So, for example, we might get one referee, as I said, that says, yes, this should be published, maybe with some revisions, another referee that rejects. And then it's the job of someone like, someone like Jan to go back and look at the article, look at those reports, and decide whether one carries more weight than the other in some sense. Maybe the negative review seems kind of superficial compared to the more positive one, in which case the more positive one would have more weight, or vice versa. He might have to go to a third referee 
we might send it to somebody who's a member of our editorial board, which is different from the editorial team, see if they can make an adjudication. So it raises a hard problem, but it's a problem that is ours, not yours, and we try to do our best with it. Editors generally follow but are not bound by referee recommendations. So if referee says reject, that does not mean that 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 it's, it's over end game for the article. It might be that rejection recommendation is one that we don't agree with because again, the reading might be superficial or based on a misunderstanding, or we think that the author just just deserves a second try for some reason. So there's not a there's not a sort of algorithm here that's going to take some judgment and some consideration on our part to figure out what to do when there's any kind of disparity among referee referee um, suggestions recommendations. What should you do when you respond by way of responding to different uh, to different sorts of verdicts? Well, you should be. My first thought is that when a paper, uh, when when a journal gets back to you and does not reject your paper, but rather says revisions are the major or minor, you might feel sad at first, but but it's actually a constructive part of the process, generally speaking, and most likely your paper is going to improve in light of comments that have that have been offered. So keep in mind, knowing yourself involves knowing that criticism can be difficult, can hurt sometimes, but avoid avoidance. I know that when I got my first rev revisions requirements, major revisions, it was kind of difficult to look at the paper again because it's not easy to be criticized, but it's really important to do it. Don't put it off. If given either a major or minor revisions recommendation by the journal, Revise that paper as soon as you can in light of those comments and include in your revised paper a detailed explanation of where and in what ways you've made changes in response to those revisions. It's really important. Make sure you convince the editors that you've done your homework in responding to those, to those requested revisions. Note that you can disagree with the referee's suggestion. Referee might say you should change blah, 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 or reconsider your position here or revise your, your some, some claim you're making. Um, you might think that they're mistaken about that, but you should make sure you give strong and compelling reasons for why you're pushing back on the referee report on that point. And if referees make contradictory demands, then it's the job of the editor is to, to adjudicate them and decide which ones you should, should follow. It's certainly no fair to an author to say, follow the referee recommendations, and then if in fact the referee recommendations are incompatible with one another. So it's our job to say which ones have to be followed. Also, revisions can add to the length of your paper. But try to keep it brief nonetheless. Sometimes it's, you just don't want to just add more stuff. You should look for ways in which you could cut in light of the things that you've, you've added. Um, Philosophia as a journal prefers manuscripts that are in the seven to 9,000 word range. That's going to vary from one journal to another. Again, brevity is still going to be important here. But there might be some unavoidable ways in which responding to referee comments are going to lengthen the paper. And that's not, that's not terrible. After submitting the revised version, the handling editor will, will ask the original referees to review this new version, but Jan and I can attest that that's an imperfect process. Maybe one of the original referees is no longer available or just can't stand it anymore, doesn't want to look at that paper anymore, they're just tired of it or something of the sort, in which case we have to go to a third referee. And that adds a level of uncertainty to all parties involved because that third referee might say, wait, the first two referees thought this paper was good enough to be revised. I don't think so. I think it should be rejected. That can happen. That raises a problem for us. So that's the sort of, those are the sort of behind the scenes conversations that my editorial team and I have on a fairly regular basis when such situations like that come up. Again, that's our problem, not yours, but it could also add to the, to the, to the length of time before you get a final report. And also it can be exasperating to feel like you're making progress with the journal. You've got it through the first revision stage. And now a new report comes in and the referee suggests rejection. If in fact the referee's reason for rejection are in our view strong and compelling, then we'll probably end up rejecting the paper, which can be frustrating for you. You might've spent the last nine months trying to make it through the process of, of this journal only to find that they that they shut the door on you. That sometimes happens. So just be ready for the fact that that's one of the, that's one of the sort of dangers of this whole process. What about just plain old rejection? Um, those of you who've uh, read Elizabeth Kubler, Kubler Ross's On Death and Dying might not know that she had a lesser known work on the response of the, the project responding to uh, journal rejection. She, uh, the same principles apply, the stages apply denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But do your best to cycle through these uh, quickly and then submit the article elsewhere if you think it's still got something, if you feel you've still got something to say. If given a reject version, again, I know it's no fun. Now your friends should buy you lunch instead of them buying, instead of you're buying them lunch. There are many other journals to submit to next. And the transfer desk, uh, my transfer desk colleagues can help you with that. 
There's little point, I think, in asking the editor to reconsider their decision. Since, first of all, we don't have time, generally speaking, to give you another start from, from scratch. And when we reject a paper, we usually hope that the author will revise it and send it elsewhere. We're not your last chance. What I have to remind myself often is there are a lot of good philosophy journals besides our own, and you should just keep on uh, trying. You'll eventually probably find a home for your, for your article. Sometimes it is wise, however, to rewrite your paper from scratch. This can improve the essay dramatically. That's certainly been my experience and that of many of my colleagues and my students. Sometimes just deleting that file from your laptop or whatever it is, starting again can help crystallize, clarify, sharpen the line of thought and can improve the, the writing dramatically. It's hard. Um, writers in English talk about kill your babies. The idea is if you've got some, some stuff you've written and you're kind of fond of it, nevertheless, it can be very helpful, very therapeutic to just drop it and start from scratch. That can often improve the writing. Those are things to consider. And of course, if you get rejected, it's always very therapeutic to go. Uh, there's a use it link to YouTube. The uh, 1980s British band Chumbawamba has a uh, great song called Tub Thumping that uh, is very, uh, very uplifting for you. So if you're feeling down about a journal rejection, go listen to, thump, to uh, Tub Thumping and they'll probably make you feel better. So again, the whole process of journal uh, submission and uh, sometimes rejection or revision is a strange kind of competition. Um, but if, you're, if you persevere, you will eventually succeed and uh, find yourself getting papers published and it's going to feel really good if you haven't done it very much yet. The more you do it, the, the more you'll enjoy it. And the more you publish, the easier it will get over time. So if you're just starting out, I know that, you know, based on my, my experience and that of many colleagues, it's hard to get your first paper published in a refereed international journal, but it can be done and you will succeed if you persevere. So I'm just going to take a little time to answer some of the questions that have been raised, and then I'll uh, let hand the conversation over to Hannah. Um, one person wrote, what to do if we face rejection from all sides? And a few things that, that I'd say about that, ask, ask colleagues that you respect to read the paper and give you honest, sometimes brutal feedback. As I said, consider rewriting the paper from scratch. Ask yourself, did any of the rejections contain feedback that could be useful? You might be feeling a little bit irritated, maybe even angry about the rejection. Still, look at those, look at those uh, uh, referee reports if you got them, see if you can use them. There are almost certainly gonna be still more journals that are worth submitting your paper to. And also it can be useful to work on something else for a little bit, then return, return, return to the paper with a fresh pair of eyes. That might help you to see why the journals didn't take it or the journal didn't take it in the first place. But also avoid the sunk cost fallacy. Just because you put some work into the paper in the past doesn't mean it's rational to keep on working on. Sometimes it's good to just carry on with something else. I've got a couple of papers that I worked on 20 years ago that I've just let sit. And maybe I'll go back to them, maybe not, but I don't feel any great need to do so at this point. So sometimes that's a good, good thing to consider. Is there any policy regarding papers which are against mainstream opinions and philosophy? I've kind of addressed that before, but let me just make sure to emphasize it. There's no policy, but the mainstream opinions are generally not without any basis. They often do have a basis. And so if you're going to row against the current um, to stick with that metaphor, then you should give your reasons for doing so. So, and, and we know full well that some of the most important papers in the past were, Im were important because they challenged mainstream opinion. So we take that sort of contribution seriously. But again, it's not easy to undermine or otherwise change those mainstream, those mainstream opinions. So, so by all means, I encourage that project, but note that it's a challenging one. Does Philosophia accept paper related to Buddhist philosophy? And my answer is this depends on the nature of the relation that you're referring to here. If the project is primarily one of exegesis of historical text, then at least our journal would say no because we're not publishing work in history of philosophy anymore. But this is a different kind of project. If the project is to defend a Buddhist perspective on a current live philosophical question, then we would take that, consider that sort of submission seriously. An example of that kind of research is Mark Sideritz's book, as well as articles that are related to it. He's got a very nice book called Buddhism as Philosophy, in which he essentially argues that if we look at some of the Buddhist texts, we're going to find inspiration that'll help us make progress on current philosophical questions. That's fine. Just as contemporary ethicists will say, I'm going to sail under the flag of Kant or Mill or Aristotle and solve current philosophical questions. That's fine. You can do those things without doing history of philosophy. So again, the distinction is between work that's primarily exegetical and work that, that aims to put historical figures in conversation with and, and recurrence in conversation with current live questions in such a way as to offer progress in these questions. So it's important to keep that distinction in mind. Tips on writing better. I've discussed that a little bit on 
on uh, in, in earlier slides, but also the Indian Philosophical Network's writing mentorship and writing rooms program seems to be great ideas, very valuable programs that are that are excellent resources to help you improve your writing. Likewise, the reading groups. Sometimes you'll read things that you feel are sort of paradigms of philosophical writing, really good examples that you'd like to emulate. Excellent, uh, excellent uh, progress to help you improve your writing as well. What about how do I navigate review and comments on the manuscript? Again, I've discussed that earlier, but also bear in mind that referees typically distinguish between what they take to be the gravamen of their criticism, that sort of central core of what they think is right or wrong with the article, as well as, and they'll distinguish that usually at the top of the report from other points that they feel are less urgent. There's unclarity in section three, the author should be right in certain ways, or there's a you know, missing citation in section four. Those are all fine, but don't get too hung up on those. The important thing is the, is the core. How to select a journal to uh, uh, an app journal for any research article. Does the author need to have plagiarism tests of the research article while sending it to publication? It's very nature and other major publishers, publishers have software that can detect plagiarism. So the answer is yes, the, 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 um, there is a plagiarism test, but it's done automatically. How to select a journal. Many factors go into selecting which journals to submit to. Is it blind refereed? Is it indexed in a way that counts in a way that matters for your home institution? Arts contents discoverable online. You don't want to be behind multiple paywalls so no one can ever access the article unless they've got to spend a lot of money. What's the average turnaround time between submission and a decision for a journal? Would having an article appear there be, be a credential for your professional needs? These are all important questions to ask, it seems to me. There's no one set of questions that will apply to everybody. Notice that once Philosophia has accepted a paper, then the author has corrected the page proofs. That paper ap appears very early on, on, on early view, the early view part of the website, and that's common among spirit and nature journals. So once you're done, there isn't a, with your part, there isn't a long waiting period before the article is available online. It might take several months before it gets assigned a particular issue, but it's still going to be available for anybody who wants to see it. And here's just a list. I'll send around these, these slides for later on. If anybody wants to refer to them. Here's a list for general of general philosophy journals that are not super prestigious, not super uh, selective. Their acceptance rates are probably like that of Philosophia, somewhere in the 20 to 40 percent range, I suppose. I suggest you bookmark between five and 10 of these and familiarize yourself with their policies, what they've published recently, what they seem to be looking for. Also, beware of scam journals. Pretty much every day I get emails from people saying, please submit your article to blah, blah, blah. We hope very much you'll do, that you'll do so, et cetera, et cetera. You end up having to pay a fee, and I don't think they get refereed in any serious way. And so I'm not sure it's worth anything to actually publish in one of these scam journals. So watch out for that, I would suggest. Um, and again, the crucial elements for legitimate journals are, A, do we have a double-blind peer review process? That is, does the author, the author should not know who the referees are and the referees should not know who the author is. That's what the double blind means. And the resulting publication if it gets published should be discoverable online. That is something that, that, that is gonna be important if you want to have your work and be influential, including being cited. Um, here's a link to the editing service. You can pay Springer Nature money and have somebody edit your paper for English, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm ambivalent about whether that's a, good thing for you to be spending your money on. I don't know for sure whether that's the best idea. We'll have to see how this Barcelona principles program develops. I'm hoping that it will result in a little bit more flexibility with regard to the kind of English that, that authors are expected to write. But we're, we're aware of the fact that people who are not native English speakers are at a some, at what I consider to be an unfair disadvantage with regard to publishing in English. So I think that's what I've got. And I want to hand over discussion now to Hannah Frage, from who's head of submissions and author services for Springer Nature. And I will mute myself. And Hannah, hopefully you will unmute and take things from here. And I guess it's probably easiest if you just tell me when I should when I should forward the slide deck, okay? Okay, uh, happy to. Um, thank you, Mitch, for um, that uh, very thorough presentation. Um, I learned quite a bit about um, how the general submission process um, operates for philosophia from the other side. So uh, thank you for all of that. Um, for um, everyone on the call, uh, most of you will not know me. My name is Hannah. I am the head of submissions and author service department for Springer Nature. Um, I um, oversee the transfer desk uh, uh, for the humanities and social science portfolio. Um, which does include uh, philosophia. And I'm going to be talking to you a bit about what the transfer desk does and how exactly we work with this particular journal as well. So Mitch, if you could uh, take us to the next slide, please. 
Yes, so I'm going to start by giving you a quick introduction to Transfer Desk, who we are, what we do, how we work. So uh, essentially, we are a service that allows authors uh, who have been rejected by their first choice journal to quickly identify um, a good alternative journal in uh, the Springer portfolio. And um, we help them complete the submission process at a quicker rate than they could normally do on their own um, through an auto through an automatic process. Um, and um, the and uh, the journals that we uh, promote within Transfer Desk um, are um, analyzed for uh, their uh, um, what's the word I would like, uh, for their compatibility with the manuscript that um, has, has just been rejected from uh, the original uh, journal. So we try and find papers, uh, we try and match journals which are going to be the best possible matches to the papers um, that we work with. So the process normally uh, begins with um, the author submitting their paper to a first choice journal. And if they get submitted, then that's what uh, if they get uh, accepted, that's wonderful. But if they don't, uh, they may be offered a transfer when their paper is rejected. Um, if they are offered that transfer, then a transfer desk will get in touch with them. Normally in about eight hours, um, we will have analyzed their paper, um, well, the, the, the paper that um, has just been rejected. And uh, we will have identified three to five other journals that take um, manuscripts in this area that we think are uh, have an appropriate acceptance threshold, um, have appropriate uh, subject focuses, and all that will have been evaluated by a subject matter expert um, who works with us at Transfer Desk. We have about 200 people working on Transfer Desk in all kinds of specialisms. Um, and uh, we offer this service for free to anyone who gets rejected from a Springer Journal. Uh, nobody has to take up the offer that we extend. Like if you're offered a transfer, you don't have to take it. But if you do decide that you are interested in one of the journals that we have um, recommended as potentially giving you a higher chance of being published next time, then um, you can get in touch with us and say, yes, I would like to transfer to this journal. And uh, if you do that, then we can take over the submission process. We can automatically transfer the paper, which is why we call Transfer Desk, um, from the uh, rejecting journal to the uh, new untried journal and save you a bit of time on that as well. And uh, hopefully you'll have more success the next time around. Uh, so that's how the process uh, works, um, sort of like for individual papers. Can we have the next slide, please? So here you'll see a couple of stats on uh, how we uh, perform at Transfer Desk. Uh, last year, uh, 475,000 um, papers were, uh, uh, were put through the um, Transfer Desk system and offered recommendations. And about 27% of those authors uh, agreed that they would like to uh, transfer their paper having received those suggestions from us. Of that number, 21% of the transferred submissions were accepted for publication. So we have a pretty good rate of success for the papers that we work with. Uh, yes, Mitch, next slide, please. So let's have a look at how Philosophia particularly performs with transfers. Um, it is our most prolific receiver in the philosophy portfolio. So it does tend to uh, become a home for lots of papers that, um, were rejected from other often quite prestigious journals within the philosophy portfolio. I have a um, like a little table on the right hand side here, which shows that uh, philosophy it receives more papers than um, as transfers than uh, the other philosophy journals in our portfolio do. Um, of the uh, you'll see on the slide here as well that uh, of the uh, 276 papers that philosophy received as of the end of june about one third of those came from transfer desk and it also offers uh, transfers to a large number of the papers it, it rejects as well um over 200 papers um that uh, that is rejected um have been offered transferred this have been offered transfers this year uh, next slide please 
So uh, when we transfer papers into philosophy, uh, and I do think this is a particularly standout journal to use as an example for uh, the work that we do, um, you can see here in the table that uh, for the last couple of years we've been, you know, this journal has been receiving a steady increase of the number of transferred papers. Um, coming through in its inflow. Um, so more and more papers have been coming through from Transfer Desk, and we have a really strong review rate for this journal. If a paper arrives here as a transfer, there is a, there is a, um, a more than 60% chance that paper is going to ultimately get reviewed. And um, for this year, uh, about 20% of all the philosophers accepted papers were transferred from, an, were originally transferred from another journal. So we know, that um, you know that uh, transfers are doing well at this journal, and um, this journal works particularly well with the transfer desk. Um, it's been uh, cut off uh, the uh, bottom of the slide deck here, but uh, I can also confirm that um, over ninety-five percent of the rejections from Philosophia go on to be offered transfers. So. Um, there, so like there is some really wonderful author service going on at this journal. We are really able to help authors, um, even those who don't get accepted by the journal, we can guide them onto places where they are more likely to get accepted elsewhere, which is something I'm really happy to report. Next slide, please. Um, so where uh, the authors who use the transfer process, uh, we, uh, how do they feel about um, the experiences that they have with us? Um, we do uh, put out a survey very regularly to ask authors uh, what they think about their experiences with us, if there's anything that we could be doing better. And we get really strong positive responses from the authors who work with us. About 96% of authors who, who use our service um, rate their experience as good or excellent. So we don't get a lot of criticism for the work that we do. Um, and we know that even authors who don't choose to are opt to use the transfer desk. Um, the uh, about, uh, you know, they decide to um, submit a paper on their own rather than using our service. We know that they still submit to the, to the journals that we recommend to them because we are usually quite accurate in the suggestions that we're able to give. We know that when we recommend a journal, um, we are, um, we do tend to pick journals where authors are likely to do well. And oftentimes those authors do agree with us. Um, so we know that a lot of those authors, even if they don't use the transfer uh, the transfer program, they choose to submit to the journals we recommend anyway. And when we ask them why they choose to uh, submit on their own rather than using a transfer service, um, um, automatic transfer, uh, they usually say, that um, they wanted to revise the paper ahead of time, which is something that we do strongly encourage. Like we do like authors to act on the feedback they receive. Um, you know, from the editors when they are rejected, that is very important. So we're happy for authors to do that. Um, we know that authors really like our service. We know that they like how accurate the recommendations are. We know that we like they like how quick we make everything. Like we take a lot of uh, effort off their plate. We can make everything very smooth. Um, and uh, oh, the uh, they want the other thing I was hoping to share with you was uh, this table on the right here, which are the uh, which which. Um, uh, shows us which journals tend to donate to Philosophia um, when they are rejecting papers um, and sending them out for transfer. We get quite a lot of um, papers from a wide variety of uh, different journals. Um, these are everything, uh, these are the uh, top donors that we've had this year to uh, Philosophy. You can see um, philosoph Philosophical Studies on there, Synthes on there, uh, Kentness has just been missed off the bottom of uh, that table, but we have some quite prestigious journals like, um, like sharing papers around that aren't quite right for their journals that do um, find homes elsewhere. So um, I just wanted to include that so we have some insight into how interconnected our portfolio is. Uh, we have a couple of uh, minutes left for questions if anybody would like to um, ask anything about the transfer process uh, or uh, if they have any questions for Mitch as well. I'm aware that uh, we've all had some time to um, absorb, the, what, uh, absorb his presentation a bit as well. So uh, any questions at all, um, feel free to ask them now. I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, just, I'm just thinking about the 28% uh, statistic that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Suppose I'm an author and I've been rejected from the first journal that I submitted to. And yes. the transfer says, hey, okay, we suggest you send this article to Philosophia, for example. But mm -hmm. I want to make some changes before I do that in light of the referee reports. 
-hmm. Is there a time period by which I've got to accept or not accept the transfer desk recommendations to use the transfer desk service? Those want to take three months to read some um, new things. Before. Can I take that long? Uh, if um, the rec if the uh, revisions you want to make are minor re revisions, um, then there is a small time period that we allow authors to make those changes within. It can be, it depends, it varies journal to journal, but um, one to two weeks is pretty normal. If there are more substantial revisions that want that uh, need to be made, we recommend against using the transfer service at that point. It's probably better to submit a fresh after that. Um, but um, you know, by then, if you've made substantial revisions, the paper that you have is probably quite a different paper to the one you started with anyway. So um, any editor comments that have been made on the previous paper, um, any decisions that were made are probably not as relevant anymore. And the transfer desk is probably a less valuable service to you at that point. So we, if you if you're going to take three months, we recommend you submitting a fresh and many of our authors do that. If it's going to take you just a couple of days or a week or two, then uh, we're very happy to give you that time time and uh you're, you know and, and we can still we can still provide you the benefits of transferring uh if, if, if it's going to be that uh, that quick very good thank you that helps me understand the 28 percent uh number that you mentioned i understand why others can still follow the suggestions even if they're not using the transfer desk service itself mm -hmm. good thanks yeah other questions for either hannah or myself i'm gonna i might stop sharing so we can see each other Jan, and also, did you want to add anything, Jan, from your perspective as an associate editor? Uh, no, thank you, Mitch. I think you covered it all. So nothing to add from, from my side. Okay. Yeah, I had a quick question for uh, Hannah, and then maybe uh, I let you know the audience pick up. Uh, is there an advantage in terms of the time taken by the journal to review my article? Uh, when compared with a transfer desk submission versus a fresh submission? Um, it will take pretty much the same amount of time for a transfer to be reviewed or an organic submission to be reviewed. Um, okay. The uh, transfers, when they arrive at a journal, they're treated exactly the same as organic okay. submissions most of the time. Um, but we can, um, if, if speed is a priority, then um, you can speak to, um, you will have um, a personal contact with the transfer desk. You can ask about the speeds of the journals that are being recommended and um, you can find the quicker ones if that's, if that's uh, a priority. Um, and we can even, you know, send you some fresh suggestions for the fastest journals if that's something that you need. I might add that as an editor, if something comes in to my journal as a transfer, I am not aware of it, that it's a transfer. I suppose that if I were more technically adept, I could probably figure that out, but it certainly is not obvious to me when I see a new submission that is a transfer from another journal. I just take it as a brand new submission and throw it in, you know, the kitty with all the rest. And so there's no, I don't, I don't take myself to need to expedite the process or anything like that. But if you need an expedited process, it can help to indicate that on your, uh, and there's a notes area in your submission that you can indicate that. And yeah, and, and if I can take that opportunity to ask Michelle a, a question, uh, since you have, you know, uh, seen probably, you know, scores of submissions from uh, Indian, you know, philosophers, uh, are there things that uh, in general that you observe that we could do some quick fix that will improve the submission rates if you have observed across the board that these are the things that typically tend to sort of uh, we lack or even from those that get published what are the things that you think that we could sort of apply is there something specific to the indian context is what uh, i thought i could ask you yeah um i guess i would say a couple of things about that one of which is that and i'm not I've not done a rigorous statistical survey of anything of the sort, but sort of impressionistically, I would say my experience with many submissions from philosophers on the subcontinent is that um, there tends to be a little bit more of a, I'm going to, you know, discuss the God question or the, the ethics question, where authors are not always specifying as precisely as they could, what question is they're trying to answer and how they want to go about addressing it. So that's one thing that I'd urge uh, prospective authors to really focus on, be really sharp and precise and crystal clear about what it is you're aiming to achieve in your submission and why you think it's worth doing. And that is addressing that live question kind of approach. That's one thing. Another thing I would say is 
you know, um, uh, be really precise and upfront about how it is that your submission is a contribution to the state of the art in the literature on the topic that you're discussing. So often we do find referees criticizing submissions because they aren't showing that they've that they've done all the homework necessary to be up to date on the latest state of the art of literature. It's something that I definitely certainly would urge you to, to make sure you're careful about, that you'd be really um, assiduous about making sure that your contribution is one that takes the conversation forward relative to what we have so far. Please. And I would say, you know, make sure, I would say, I would suggest everybody work really hard to make sure the writing is clear, precise, rigorous wherever possible. Avoid metaphor and other for, uh, sorts of figurative language wherever possible. Those are those are also important factors in my view. Uh, we have a question. Yeah, Chaitanya. Did you want to, Chaitanya? Did you want to? You can. Yes. 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 Uh, thank you, Sushmit. Um, and um, yeah, thanks, Mish, uh, for the for the value, uh, you know, uh, invaluable presentation. And I think it will be helpful immensely to all of us. Uh, just a couple of questions. One is, um, I think on the first slide itself, in the first very first sentence, uh, it mentions this that um, the article um, should. I mean, even if it is well argued, uh, if it is merely your opinion, then uh, it's not really the good idea to uh, send it for the publication. If I have understood you correctly, so if if there is something, there is some error in how I understand. Then please rectify that. Or um, if it is correct, then uh, I will. I'm, I'm just wondering what it means that because we have. I think many of us have been thinking that well, argument is what maybe is one of the uh, sort of crux of your paper. That if it is well argued, then um, that perhaps satisfy one of the uh, most important criteria. So what do you mean when you say even if it is well argued? You know, uh, if it is your merely opinion, then you know it shouldn't uh, be sent. That is number one, and uh, number two is. Uh, Chai, Chai, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. forget if you, if you ask two questions. I'll forget the first one, but by the yeah, time you're done, yeah, one. So, so let me ask that one, and then we'll go back to your second one if that's okay. So, so I guess I would say what I meant by that is not the issue is not so much an opinion. If you can justify it, it's more than opinion. It might be something that that approaches knowledge. What matters rather is. If you are, I've seen a lot of submissions in which the author is, has a series of interesting reflections on certain topics. And that's nice, but it's not quite what journals are looking for because it's not clear how those reflections connect with, engage with, address that dialectical process that I've been referring to as something that's making its way through many journals. Okay, so the, the, an article that's a series of reflections on interesting questions can be reformatted without too much violence to the article, in my view, by saying, I'm going to directly and explicitly address these issues that I take to be live and current in the, in the state of the art on a certain topic. Okay, so it's if, if you're justified, then your, your epistemic state is more than opinion. It might indeed be something that approaches knowledge. What matters is the presentation that you give of those ideas, as opposed to a series of reflections which might be might be interesting enough I think it's going to be much more successful if you can pitch it as, formulate it as, here's how I want to engage with this dialectic, which dialectic has been making its way through this and other journals for the last several years or decades or maybe even longer than, than that. Does that help clarify? Uh, yes, I mean, I think that, that answers the question. I, uh, Very good. And you had a second uh, yeah. question. Yeah, the other point is I just wanted uh, uh, you to, if possible, also talk about the uh, policies that some journal um, have, uh, the simultaneous submission they allow. Um, so sometimes, you know, some of us who are just, uh, you know, uh, I mean, early sort of career academics. So uh, we might struggle with that, you know, I mean, we might mm -hmm. end up submitting same paper, maybe, you know, in two journals and, you know, it might lead to some kind of uh, sort of confusion. So. Is it the case that some journals do have such policy of psychology? I would say most journals, at least Anglophone journals, have a strong, I'd say maybe strict policy against simultaneous submissions. And if you submit an article to any, tell me if I'm wrong, Hannah, 
to any Springer Nature Journal, you're expected to click on a box that says, I hereby testify that this article is not under submission elsewhere. And I think the motivation behind that is that it seems unfair. I mean, assessing, giving a careful and rigorous review of a journal submission is a lot of labor. It's my labor, it's Jan's or another associate editor's, it's that of referees, it's a lot of work. So for us to say, we've spent many person hours assessing your article as to whether or not it's, it merits publication, and you say, oh, thanks, and you know, we might say, and yes, we're, we're willing to accept it for publication. And you say, well, thanks very much, but I'm gonna have it published in another journal because they accepted it too. That's you know frustrating from our end because it's a huge waste of our time, right? There are other fields, my understanding um, is that in legal academic, in the, le in the world of law professors, um, simultaneous submissions are considered acceptable. But in academic philosophy, they're certainly not. And um, you very much want to, want to avoid that. And so the, the danger that that raises is that a journal can sit on your article for a long time, and there's sort of therefore an embargo on it. You're kind of not allowed to send it elsewhere. But I would suggest that if you feel that, that a journal is taken longer than is fair, and journals typically advertise on their home pages what they expect, the time by which they expect to give you a decision about your submission. It's entirely within your rights to, after that time period has gone by, write a polite letter to the editor saying, would you please let me know the status of my submission? It's been, you know, I submitted the following date and it's beyond what you said in your website, you get back to me by. And if they don't respond or if they do respond and then another three or four months go by, you still haven't heard anything, then you're within your rights to withdraw that submission and, and send it somewhere else. And I would urge authors to do that just by way of protecting their own interests. It's unfair for a journal to sit on an article for longer for longer than they advertise. And of course, there, as I said before, there's a certain amount of uncertainty about this referee said they're going to they're going to, to referee the article and they had a health crisis. And so now I've got to start from scratch finding new referees for the article, et cetera, et cetera. That can slow down the process. And if that happens, normally the editor or the associate editor will contact the author and let them know what the problem is and then let the author decide whether or not they want to continue to be considered by that journal or whether they'd like to withdraw the article. I think an editor has a, an author has a right to make that decision. Does that help, Siddharth? I mean, does that help? I, I've got you. Does that, does that help a little bit? Yes, yes, it does indeed. Yeah, thank you. Any, sure thing. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, Siddharth yes. has a question. Siddharth. Yes. Siddharth, you're you're muted. Uh, yeah. Hi. Thanks, Ishwar, mm -hmm. and uh, thanks, Dr. Green and Hannah and uh, <clears throat> Shell. Uh, I have two questions. The first is. Uh, what percentage of submissions typically get this rejected at Philosophia and other journals? I mean, I also asked because when I was looking at the site, uh, I mean, it says the first, the median time to first response is nine days. So I was wondering if there's uh, a higher proportion of desk rejects at Philosophia. I don't know. I'm not sure if I know the statistic. Ken, do you know it? It's um, on, uh, on the journal website of Springer. Oh, is that on the, on the website? That might need to be updated. My impressionistic experience is that probably 30, 35% of submissions are desk rejected. Does that correspond to your general experience, Anna? Um, We know that the uh, review rate of Philosophia sits at just over 60%. So okay. um, so by, by inference, yes, we can, you know, like 30 something percent seems about right for a desk reject. Is that the norm across, I mean, Anglophone philosophy journals, or they vary very wildly. They uh, it can be very very different from journal to journal. There'll be some uh, journals that desk reject the vast majority of the submissions that come in, and there will be some um, that have even higher rates than Philosophia. I would say Philosophia has actually quite a good rate of uh, it's quite a low rate of desk rejects compared to um, most of the journals that I work with because I work with a whole philosophy portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, so I would say, yeah, it's um, lower rate than average for desk rejects. Uh, yeah. I'm glad to hear that, by the way. That's all <laughs> <glad> right. To... <laughs> I didn't know. Um, thank you very much. Ganesh, you had a question. I wanted to ask a question that, um, as, as you rightly pointed, that there should be no jargon used. If it is used, we have to define it very clearly 
So the question that I want to raise is that if we are say coining a new term um, and, and we are defining it as well, and and then how do the editors or reviewers kind of uh, think about that in, in a, uh, we can say, how would they weigh that? That is uh, what I want to yes, ask. Yes, I just have a question. Thank you for that. I don't see any problem with pointing a new term as long as you as long as you define it carefully. Um, I guess the only reason the person might might object to that is if they don't feel it's necessary to coin a new term. That is to say, um, if there's if there's some reason to think that there's already terminology that covers that. You're making the reader work harder by essentially learning some new language or something. But if you feel, no, we need a new concept, we need a new term to discuss the kind of thing I'm talking about, I'm going to define it and carry on from there. I think there's nothing objectionable about that. It's perfectly appropriate. And standard standard procedure in philosophy as far as I'm concerned. So I can't see any, see any difficulty with that. Thank you. I should say, in response to something you said in the first part of your question, jargon per se is not a problem. Just make sure any jargon you use, that's beyond what you'd expect someone with a degree in philosophy. Um, any jargon you use is something that you do define carefully. And when, if you're unsure, I'd say if you're ever unsure about whether some jargon needs to be defined, define it. Define it. Thank you. Other questions? Siddharth, did you put your hand up again? Yeah, I, I mean, if it's okay, can I ask another one? Of course. Uh, this is more a, a general question. So when we are suggesting uh, uh, potential reviewers, is it all right if I suggest someone who I don't know personally well, but who probably knows who the author is, would identify me because I presented at a conference or discussed mm. this idea with them some other time? Is that acceptable? It's or? not inappropriate. I understand the question. It's not inappropriate to do so, but it does sometimes happen that We'll contact a referee that you recommend in a situation like the, the one you described. If I contact that referee and ask them to referee your paper, they might say, "But I, I'm sorry, I know this person, and so I can't do it. I can't. I can't uh, do. I can't be a blind referee at that at this point. That would violate the sort of standard procedure. So it might be that it's kind of a wasted suggestion on your part. Okay. Right. Um, hard to be sure, but that's been my experience thus far. It sometimes happens happens that the that the potential referee says. I don't think I should be refereeing this because I, I I know this person, I know the authors. So that I would, I guess my recommendation, it's not a strict one, but suggestion is that it's probably best, probably best to avoid someone like that, given that background. Thank you. Anybody else? There are 40, 35 people who haven't raised any questions yet, probably. So I'd very much like to hear from some of the rest of you. Well, I just have a minute. I just want to emphasize that submissions that are a little bit more ambitious because they want to change the questions that are being asked or pose a question that has not been posed before or reorient the field in a certain way, those are as I say, ambitious, they they take some courage and so forth, but I don't want to suggest that those are beyond what we'd consider. Those are things that we'll take seriously as well. They're fighting an uphill battle in some respects, they're swimming upstream, but those are things that are that are worth considering. So it's not the only it's it's not the case that the only method is take a question that's being discussed by others and try to answer it better than others have. That's one relatively standard approach, perhaps a little bit more conservative. Um, but there are others that are more that are more ambitious that are worth considering as well. I think I saw a hand and then it disappeared. So if you raised your hand, you should unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Dush Ruth or other members. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. You know, I, I was just wondering, I mean, you have given a, a very comprehensive overview of the, the writing and uh, review process. But I also wanted to pick your brain as a philosopher. So many of us are early career uh, researchers, and many times we feel that we want to work on something that's completely different from our, you know, thesis topic. So, yeah. and I'm sure you have moved on from, you know, um, one domain to another domain. So let's say something intrigues you, maybe artificial intelligence or something else. So how do you yeah. go about working on an area that 
you have sort of never really you know studied uh, as part of your you know um, research career but then how do you go about exploring a topic so that you could make a relevant contribution to it in, sure. in that's a great that's a great question there are a number of strategies that i would consider that might or might not equally apply to everybody depending upon their current professional situation so one thing is to at least at the get-go is to see whether you could teach a course on the topic so for example just four or five years ago when my daughter was at university she took a class on environmental philosophy from a colleague of mine a friend of mine who happened to teach at that at that school and i got interested in it and decided i wanted to start preparing to, to offer some courses on that as well so i kind of educated myself as best i could in the time that i had about environmental philosophy and i really enjoyed teaching the course i'm not yet at level doing research on that topic in that area but maybe someday i will be but teaching a course on the topic that you'd like to sort of branch out into is one way to do it um uh Another approach would be to see if it's possible to get any teaching or other release time from your home institution, whether you could make a case that says, I think that the following topic is important for me to research. I think I can make contributions to it, but I need to spend some time getting up to speed, in which case mm -hmm. I'd like you to you know, go to your dean or something and say, I'd like you to give me some, some sabbatical or some other or a teaching reduction or a reduction in some other of my duties in order to give me time for that. So that's one thing to, to consider. Another approach is to say, you know, I feel like I've done a lot of work on these topics and I want to work on something new to, even if you aren't able to get a reduction in some of your other commitments or responsibilities, to go to your department head or dean or whoever it is that's responsible for helping out with your professional development to say, you know what, I'm probably going to be publishing a little bit less over the next year. And the reason is that I want to dig, I want to drill down into a topic that's relatively new for me. I think it will pay benefits two or three or four years from now, but right now in the short term, it might be relatively slow in terms of my research productivity because I've just got to get, I've got to get, get, you know, up to an expert level on that topic. So I need to be patient. If you're in a situation professionally in which you think that's a, that's a, you know, the suggestion that would be met with, with a reasonable amount of sympathy and understanding and accommodation that that's, then I'd say that's another approach. So those are a couple of different ideas. Teach a course on the topic that'll mm -hmm. kind of force you to, to become educated about it. The other one is see if you can get some release time from your institution in order to do that with a you know, promise that you'll be able to produce great things later on. And third, a kind of fallback is if you can't get release time, at least warn people that you might not be producing as much research on the topics that you've been doing thus far because now, it's, now you're going to take your time to branch out. And I would say as a sort of guideline or caveat about that is to pitch it, suggest that you pitch it as not so much, I'm going to switch into another topic, or another area in philosophy, but rather mm -hmm. I'm going to expand my mm -hmm. repertoire so that I'll still be doing work on this topic that I did my dissertation on or whatever, but I also want to enhance it by, by engaging with this, this new area. I think that'll probably sell better than it would if you came across as just kind of switching uh, switching horses across the river and so forth. And I should say that when I was a pre-tenure junior professor in my first job, when I came up for a sort of midterm review, three years into my tenure track, six year um, review uh, process, in which I had to go, come up for tenure, my dean, my, my sorry, department head at that time said, you know, Mitch, in the first three years, you've published several things, but they're on very different topics. I'm not really seeing how they connect together. Maybe you should, by the time you're ready to come up for tenure itself, be able to explain how they do connect. And I, I took that advice quite seriously and focused, made, first of all, made a point of not spreading myself too thin. And secondly, in those areas in which I was branching out, I was I tried to be careful you know, in my explanation about my research to say these things too, do relate to each other, even if it's not obvious how, how they do so. So that's something, at least from my own anecdotal experience, is something that, that I'll just mention perhaps will be helpful to you as well. Thank you so much. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Chaitan, oh, thanks, Chaitan. It's a thumbs up. <laughs> Other question. Oh, hello, sir. Can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah, so thank you for the presentation. It was really helpful. I thank just, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask if we have can suggestions on, like, how can we decide who can be an appropriate reviewer for a paper? Sure. If you can, have, oh, yeah. Sure. Um, so a couple of things. Suppose you're writing a paper. You're going to have a bibliography at the end of it. 
that will recite the sources that you're responding to. In general, if there's an author that you think is an important expert in the, in the area that you think would be qualified, you probably would think they'd be qualified to assess your research. And that's a very natural sort of candidate to be a potential referee that you can suggest. I would say if you're directly criticizing someone, then it might be a little bit risky because we're all human, we're all imperfect in some way or other. And if I, as an author, am criticized by a submission that I'm refereeing, then I might be a little bit defensive and not be as impartial as I ought to be. So perhaps avoid the people that you directly attack if you attack anybody in your paper. But people that are expert are going to be ones that you know. Again, I would say not people from your own home institution, because that will look from the point of view of editors that you might be sort of too cozy with them. So we'll probably avoid those, those folks from avoid asking those types of people to be referees for your paper. Another thing is to stick your topic or your article title or the article titles that you're, that you're responding to into a search engine like Google Scholar and see what comes up with Google Scholar. And that might show you what other authors have responded to some of the other literature that you're also writing about. And you might find that some other author has also published articles that, that are relevant to this topic. And, it, and you might or might not be citing them, but even if you're not citing them, they might still find that those are appropriate experts on that in the field. So those are some ideas. Jan, did you want to add anything else? You might have some other thoughts about this too. Uh, on, no, I'm, I'm just reading in the chat. So I, I don't have any thoughts on that, but I just noticed that there is a, a message in the chat. Oh. Uh, but I can take the occasion to reply to that, if that's okay. Yeah, uh, so can I just say, it's not necessary to, to suggest possible reviewers. That's optional. Yeah. If you choose not to, that's perfectly okay. Jan, go ahead. Exactly, that's what I wanted to say. Oh. And uh, moreover, um, the person is asking um, why, so it says, um, if the manuscript is going to be anonymized for the review process, then I wonder why a reviewer would refuse to review if they know the submitter personally. I mean, if anonymity is maintained strictly, then the reviewer would never know about the submitter during the review process. We just, just had such a case. Yeah, so in, in certain specialized fields, you may be very familiar with a person's work. So although no name appears or anything that identifies that person, you're very familiar with the work. So that could happen. So you can identify the person from the work only. Maybe you can add to that, Mitch. Yeah, sure. So I've been working, there are certain topics that I've been working on for 30 years now. And I can see, I can easily imagine getting a submission to referee in which I think after paragraph three, oh, I know who this is. No one else would say something like that and so forth. So and that's the case, even if the article has been has been scrupulously anonymized. So there's no there's no foolproof process. And also, Jan and I and other colleagues learned that that it's acceptable for researchers to post preprints of their articles on their website, their homepage, on various kinds of uh, uh, hosting services and so forth. So the fact that as a referee, I could, if I wanted to, search, stick the title of your article into a search engine, perhaps find it somewhere else, that I used to think is something that we should avoid and make sure authors of submitted articles don't do that. But it's actually a, a policy for publishers to allow researchers to do that for the sake of develop, you know, promoting research and disseminating research. So if somebody is really wants to find out who an author of an article is, they probably will be able to. The whole idea of blind refereeing is an ideal that we try to try to achieve, but probably never perfectly perfectly uh, reach. So, so it's an it's an aspiration. Generally speaking, the process works well. Um, so here's here's Supriya's question: What is the possibility of for acceptance or rejection once minor revisions are asked from the journal? I would say I would say the possibility is the, the prospects are, are quite good, I would say, certainly better than 50%. If the journal says minor revisions and you make those revisions in a scrupulous and careful way and explain how and what ways you've made, you've made them, then I think you should feel fairly confident that the journal will say, thank you, fine, everything's good, we now accept your paper. So if you get to the point of making um, minor revisions, you should be feeling pretty good. <laughs> Still do your work and do all your homework and so forth, but but you should feel like you're on the home stretch. That's a nice nice place to be. We got time, I think, for one question. Of course, you're very welcome. See, so, Ruth, you've been quiet this entire time. You must have <laughs> one question or two. Do you have yeah, one? I have more than asked. I mean, I also wanted to ask Jan what was his 
I mean, is that the way I asked uh, Mitch? Uh, do you, you know, see any typical patterns uh, with respect to submissions from the subcontinent? I'm also asking because if there's some quick picks, something that we, you know, we are blind to, we could probably incorporate in our drafts and, you know, probably, you know, better our chances. Yeah, thanks. That's a very difficult question to ask and also to answer, I think. So it's, it's hard to say if there is a general pattern. Mm -hmm. First, when, well, first of all, as Mitch said before, I have to point this out again. We um, we changed the subtitle of the journal so to include uh, um, the whole world uh, and welcome it to philosophy. And this means also to appreciate cultural differences. So it's very hard. And I think we have to learn about this more. And there are, of course, different ways to speak or different ways to present a problem. And I think it's on both sides. So we learn about different authors from different regions in the world and different ways of putting their thoughts. Um, so it's hard to say if there is a general pattern. I think I would just repeat what Mitch said. It's often what I found, and it's very tendentious what I say here, but, <laughs> but sometimes it's more about the big thing. And mm -hmm. that tends to be, can be not sufficiently clear then mm -hmm. so if you have the big question then you have to say exactly what it is that question that you have in mind and how you want to address that question and sometimes that's missing that's maybe all i can say here so be clear what you're heading for also look at this other submissions in in the in the area you work in. Um, this can be helpful and i'll just add thanks for that jan i'll just add um one of my mentors back when I was a youth said that uh, the best philosophers are ones that can move back and forth between the big picture, really big questions, and then can negotiate from that to fine-grained, detailed argumentation, and that are able to, to, to do both. And I, I think that's really important and valuable and something to keep in mind as a writer, is to keep your eyes on the big, big questions, but not let them ex be, be all that you discuss in your paper. Get down to you know brass tacks, nitty gritty details, whatever it is you want to, however you want to describe them um, uh, when it's appropriate. Detailed argumentation uh, has a place in philosophy and hopefully always will. Um, there's one question from Yogeshwar, can you just some hands on tips on how to go about working on your manuscript? Narrowing down the topic. Yeah, that's a very hard question. It's, I think, something that we all struggle with, no matter what. Um, it certainly is important to narrow down the topic. And in my experience, people who are starting out their career generally benefit from narrowing down a topic to something very specific and then becoming, at least in the first part of their career, one of the people that's known in the research community as someone who works on a very specific topic. Sometimes it is going to be more technical, but not necessarily. So there's something to be said for kind of earning, building your reputation at the beginning of your career as someone who's, you know, got the most interesting and most up-to-date research on a very certain specific topic. Could be technical or it could be on, you know, theories of forgiveness or something that isn't necessarily technical, but is still is still a topic that is that is important and, and discussed discuss nowadays. Um, uh, so, so that's one strategy. And I understand there's plenty of pressure to publish. And I would say, you know, there, make sure you understand what your own institution's expectations are and, you know, work within them. I would say something like go a little bit above those expectations, but not too far above those expectations, because that would just seem unnecessary to do that. But I would say, when in doubt, make sure you know what the expectations are and, and, and transcend them by a little bit and then leave plenty of room for yourself just to continue to explore and develop those ideas. Um, but it's just a fact of academic life that we're under pressure to, to publish and the pressure is harder when you're starting out. And I think if you get a handful, two or three or four publications early in your career, in referee journals that have an international profile, that's going to set you up. That's the hardest part of your research career, probably. But if you can do that, that's going to set you up for, for success later on because you'll build on that 
even if you include new topics in your area, you'll be able to build on your accomplishments there. I think will be probably easier later on. Yeah, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I just mentioned that um, the big questions uh, can, can tend to be imprecise and um, make the reader wonder what the, the author is um, aiming at. Um, at the same time, it's not it, if you go too deep into the details, that can be bad as well. So you can, can get lost there somehow. So you, you have to somehow frame the question that you're aiming at in a way that is understandable to your readers. And I think Mitch's advice was very good. So uh, think of um, potential readership for your, for your article and try to address the problem in such a way that these people know what you're talking about. This could be a helpful way. And what you want to say about it. And I think that the resources that IPN has, reading groups and paper discussion groups and so forth, they're fantastic. And so I would urge everybody on this call to, to try to make use of them and maybe propose new, you know, to the moderators of the IPN, propose new areas for, you know, discussion and so forth that, that are useful to people. So that's a great forum, especially if you're geographically isolated, you don't have a whole lot of people in your own town or university to, to talk philosophy to. This is a, a wonderful opportunity to help build your, build your research strengths uh, by collaborating with people that are in other parts of the country. I think we're about out of time. So sure yeah, yeah to... right. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, you know, um, you know, make this point that I, I've spoken to quite a few colleagues uh, who have submitted uh, at Philosophia in the last couple of years, and they have been uh, extremely satisfied with the way, you know, um, you know, either in the choice of I mean, the reviewers' comments and how the, you know, editors handle the reviewers and suggestions. So I think uh, I would encourage uh, you know everybody here uh, if they have articles suitable for the journal to you know definitely try and submit and I think it will grow it will you know philosophy is only will only grow in stature uh, from here on so uh, thanks once again to uh, Mitch Hannah and Yan for you know sparing time and talking to all of us I really appreciate this outreach and and I hope we can find more ways to collaborate. Uh, you know, we definitely look forward to that. And thanks everyone for, you know, uh, being here. And once uh, I have the slides, I would definitely uh, pass it on to all members present here. Yeah, thanks a lot and good day. Thank you. Well, I will take the slides and send them off to you all so you all have access to them. Thanks everybody. It was a pleasure to talk to you and to hear your questions yeah. and I hope you all Thank you. get in touch. Yeah. Take care. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And thanks, Hannah, for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Your your no. uh, your comments are really helpful. No problem. The pleasure was all mine. Things I didn't know. Got me some things I didn't know. So mm -hmm. I'm, I feel like I'm getting a better understanding of how the transfer desk works. It was always a little bit mysterious to me. But uh, mm -hmm. but uh, oh, if you ever have any further questions, you can always email, and uh, I'll clarify anything you want to know. Thanks. Um, much yes. Okay. Uh, well, goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much for your uh, time and attention today. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.